All right, if you have your Bibles, turn your attention with me to the Gospel of Luke, 19th chapter. Let's unpack verse number 11. I want to show you something here as we continue with the series, The Foundation. Now, if you've not been a part of this series teaching, we're, we're, we're coming from the Gospel of Luke, 6th chapter, verses 47 through 49, where Jesus highlighted two different individuals. One built his house, and it had a foundation, and one built his house, and he had no foundation. And the foundation, according to Jesus, was the Word of God. We, we looked into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, where the Bible highlights Jesus as the foundation that we're all supposed to be building on. And so we began this series with the Word of God being foundational. It's our building place. It's our starting place in life. We built from there. We talked about creation. We talked about the foundation of man and God's creation of man, his creation of woman, marriage, family, and then in the last part, seven, two weeks ago, we dealt with the topic of children and how that God has caused us to raise up children that advance his kingdom and that literally carry uh, uh, the kingdom of God into society. And, and now I want to I wanna take that just a little bit further that I believe will relate to every one of our lives, parents and, and everyone. I want us to look here at, fir at, at uh, uh, first at, at, at verse number 11 in Luke 19 because Jesus is establishing something that I don't want us to pay attention to. Because the Bible says that as, he, as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. So what is a parable? Why did Jesus teach in, a par in parables and what is a parable? A parable is a parallel. It's to take a natural, simple story to convey a spiritual truth. And Jesus taught in parables, and for simple-minded people like me, that helped me understand the word. Amen. I can't understand big words that only you in the dictionary understand. I like the simplicity of Jesus' teachings, and I love that he taught in parables. And so he speaks this parable, which is a parallel. It's to take a natural story to explain a spiritual truth. But why did Jesus teach this parable Let's look in verse 11. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem. Number one, he was nigh to Jerusalem. What was going to happen in Jerusalem? In Jerusalem, he was going to be crucified. In Jerusalem, Jesus was going to die for our sins. And so he wanted them to have an understanding before he went into Jerusalem where he would spend four days, be judged and crucified, dead and buried and raised after three days and three nights. But not only... Because he was not in Jerusalem, where he knew what was going to happen. But also, verse 11 says, because they thought, they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Let's read, beginning with the word and, the, that statement out loud. Ready? Read. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Now, I want to highlight a prophecy before we read any further here in Luke 19. And the prophecy that I want to highlight is recorded in Isaiah chapter 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, we, 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 we hear this prophecy oftentimes around Christmas. It's in Christmas cards and banners and what have you. But it's, a, it's an important prophecy for every believer to understand. And that prophecy is this. And I'm reading from Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Stay with me in Luke 19, put a bookmark, or, but I want you to be able to go back there. But here's the prophecy. Isaiah 9 and 6 is what God said. He, said for, he spoke through Isaiah. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Why is it worded like that? Unto us a child is born, a son is given. Because the child, the body that was conceived in the virgin womb of Mary, that child was born. But the son of God was given. Why? Because the son has always been. Hallelujah. 1 John 5 and 7 says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, or the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and they have always been. So Jesus' origin was not the virgin womb of Mary. Jesus' beginning was not Bethlehem. No, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Son was given, the child was born. 
And the first thing that we find out about this son that was given in Isaiah 9 and 6 is this. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Could you say that out loud? And the government shall be upon his shoulder. So if you were an Israelite in the Old Testament and you read the scroll of Isaiah, you would know that God was going to send forth his son, that a child would be born. Hallelujah. The same son that he promised back in the beginning when Adam and Eve had sinned against God and God brought in Adam and Eve and the serpent and he, he announced a judgment that would come uh, uh, to the serpent that, that God was going to bring forth a son out of the womb of the woman and that son would crush the serpent's head and in the process have his heel bruised. Well, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, born under the law, born under through a woman to redeem you and I. Hallelujah. And when Jesus was born, when Jesus was conceived in the virgin womb, of Mary, 4,000 years of prophetic word had manifested when God wrapped himself in flesh and came into this earth as Emmanuel, God with us. Can you say amen, believers? Hallelujah. That's what we celebrate as Christians 365 days a year, including December 25th. So he said, unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders. Jesus does not ride the shoulders of government. Government is to ride the shoulders of Jesus. You and I as believers should not ride on the shoulders of government. Government should rise upon our shoulders. Amen. So the, 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 the children of Israel heard this prophecy that his name would be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, before you think that this is not related to what we read in Luke 19, listen to what Isaiah 9, 7 says. It's going to tie right back into Luke 19. What, I, what I'm wanting to do is, is to show you in the Word why Jesus is going to teach this parable that we're getting ready to study in Luke 19. You have to understand, sometimes we don't get the what of a thing because we don't understand the why behind the thing. What's never become important until you understand why. You understand what I'm saying to you? That there's a why behind a what. Have you ever given your child an assignment and told them what to do, and you didn't take time to explain the why? You just said, do this, and that was the what? But then they didn't do it like you said, and then later you had to come back when it didn't work and say, this is why I told you to do it this way? Right? I mean, like, I have to tell my, my boys, look, don't put bagged trash out in the trash area. Put it in a can. That's the what. Then it rains, and you didn't do that, and I got a bag full of trash and water. That's the why. I told you to put it in a can with a lid. All right? So Jesus is about to give us a what. I want you to see the why. All right? And so and when you get to verse 7 of Isaiah 9, here is, is what we really need to get a hold of. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So God promised that he was sending forth his son and that his son would have the government resting on his shoulders. And of this and this government and the increase of this government, there would be no end to this government and its peace. And then he goes on to say, and upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So if you read that as a believer, you would say, oh, when God sends forth his son, government shall rest upon his shoulder of his kingdom. There shall be no end. And in his kingdom, there will be justice and there will be judgment and there will be peace. And you would be in expectation and you would be in hope for that day to come. So let's, let's turn our attention back to Luke 19. Because the disciples were expecting 
Jesus to place the government on his shoulders. They were expecting for Jesus to manifest his kingdom. In other words, to take over. You know, hear what I'm saying to you. I mean, how many believers am I talking to you right now that are looking for Jesus to return and take over? Come on, somebody. Amen. To put an end to all this mess. Man, our world is broken. If you cannot look in this world and see how broken it is, you are not looking. This world is broken right now. The violence, the, the, the senseless killing, when you look at what's going on, not just in Shreveport, everywhere. I mean, the, the world we're living in has fallen, and not just in our nation. It's global. You, you, we, we had 40 earthquakes the other day in one day. In one day, everything that Jesus said about the last days is coming to pass. We're living in the last days, and our only hope is the return of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I know people have been saying, people say, oh, people been saying that forever. Well, they better be because that's what we've been told to say. That, that, that's what the Word of God promises, and we know that he's the only hope. So the disciples were in this moment saying, okay, Jesus, you've been here three years. You've been teaching. You've been gaining popularity. You done started working miracles. Everybody knows who you are. You've been revealed as the Son of God. The other day, we had 5,000 show up in our meeting, not including women and children. A little bit before that, we had 4,000. Momentum is gaining. People know your name. You are popular. All right, now, Jesus, when are you going to sit on the throne and take over and bring the sovereignty to the nation of Israel? Israel, back to Israel and back to the throne of David. They thought that he was going to restore the kingdom immediately. Am I, are y'all with me here? They weren't the only ones. The Romans thought it too, and that's why when Jesus was judged in John chapter 18, he was brought before Pilate. And if you look at that conversation that Pilate had with Jesus, the first thing and really the only thing he wanted to know about Jesus was, are you a king? And what did Jesus say? He said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. But my kingdom is not from this. And then Pilate looked back and said, so you are a king. Jesus said, well, you said it. <laughs> and then Jesus, and he said, well, answer me. Are you a king? And then Jesus said, for this purpose, I was born. The only reason that Pilate got involved with Jesus and had him ultimately executed was over the threat that this man might actually become king. That's why they put Jesus, king of Jews, in three languages inscripted above Jesus' head on the cross. That's why they played the king's game with him when they put the crown of thorns over his head and arrayed him in a purple robe and mocked him as king. Is that, oh, you are a king? He was mocked as a king. They thought, the kingdom of God would immediately appear. That was the expectation of the disciples. But Jesus knew that before he ever came as the lion, he would first die as a lamb. Before he would ever wear that crown of gold on his head, he would first wear a crown of thorns. And that before he was ever given the throne of glory, he would first be given a cross of shame. Jesus knew that this first advent had a different script than what they had expected. Now, it wasn't that it wasn't in the Word. The 22nd Psalm laid out what would happen to Jesus. Verse 16 prophesied that his hands and his feet would be pierced. Isaiah 53 gave a story that was so horrific that they said, Who will believe our report? When Isaiah penned the 53rd uh, 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 chapter uh, of, of his prophecy that unfolded the, 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 the agony of what Jesus would go through. Such agony that an Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 read it and said, who, who is this man speaking of? Who would endure such pain and agony? And Philip, by the Spirit of God, used that scripture of Isaiah 53 and preached Jesus. But that was not what the disciples were expecting. They thought the kingdom of God, look at it in the latter part of verse 11. Read it with me again. They thought that the kingdom of God, read it, should immediately appear. Isn't that just like us? We're always ready for God to do something immediately. We we're looking for God to hey, do it quick, Lord. I ain't got but a minute. I mean, God sent salvation through a child. That means he's a very patient God. And he promised that child 4,000 years before he actually came. That's an extremely patient God. Amen. 
But Jesus has got to, 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 to get an understanding to his church and to the disciples that, no, my kingdom is actually not going to immediately appear. As a matter of fact, I'm going to advance my kingdom in a way you may not have realized. I'm going to advance my kingdom through my church. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the first gifts he gave the church in Matthew 16 was when he established his church. And that, that church was established on two questions. Who do they say I am? And who do you say I am? Who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? We can't reconcile what the world thinks of him until we know who he is. You can't share a Jesus you don't know. You can't preach a Jesus you hadn't heard of. You can't share the conviction of Jesus to someone else until you have been convinced. Hallelujah. And so Jesus said, who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? And when Peter, by the Spirit of God, spoke up and said, oh, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Jesus looked back at Peter and said, upon this I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And under this church I will give the keys to the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom was given to the church. The keys of the kingdom was given to the church. And what did he say about that? He said, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And what that is saying is, is that I want you, church, to bind on earth what I have bound in heaven. I want you, church, to loose on earth what is loosed in heaven. Simply put, the church is advancing the will. The church is advancing the will of heaven in the earth. That's your mandate. That's my mandate. That's your purpose. That's my purpose, that we advance the will of heaven in the earth. You say, I had never heard that. Then you haven't read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 10 when he taught us how to pray, and, uh, or Matthew 6 verse 10 when he taught us how to pray what did he say he said pray like this our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name help me if you know it thy kingdom come thy will be done where on earth as it is where in heaven so the, so the mandate that we've been given is to advance the will of heaven in the earth that's kingdom work to take my life, for you to take your life and use our lives and every seat of influence to advance his kingdom. Yeah. That was going to be the method that he would expand his kingdom, but it was not a method that they expected. So when they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear, watch verse 12. He said, therefore, read that out loud. He said, therefore, all right, Word of God, people, when you see the word therefore, tell me about that. It is there for a reason. Anytime you read therefore, it's there for a reason. It always connects what's about to be said to what was said. So they thought the kingdom of God should what? Immediately appear, therefore, therefore, he's going to give this parable. Here's the parable. Verse 12. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a what? Kingdom and to do what? Return. In this parable, Jesus is the nobleman. Gone into a far country, heaven, ascended to the Father, to receive his kingdom, that's Revelation chapter 5, and to return. Oh, glory. All right? Now, while... We await his return, and before departing, notice what he does in verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered unto them ten pounds and said unto them, read the next four words, occupy till I come. Occupy these talents till I come, till I come. Now notice, he called ten servants and he, caught, and he gave each, and he gave them a total, uh, he gave them 10 pounds. Now, 10 is an interesting biblical number. It, 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 its meaning is so in-depth, it's so powerful. It speaks of God's order in the earth. It, it speaks of his uh, rule in the earth. It speaks of what he's doing in the earth and what he's doing through man. It's made up of the number four and the number six. The number four in the Bible represents what God is doing in the earth. 
God sent his son into the earth, and we have four gospels that record his life from birth, from conception to, 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 to birth, life, death, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, all right? The fourth clause in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Four represents what God is doing in the earth. He gave uh, us 10 commandments. The first four deal with our relationship with him. Four is the number of what God is doing in the earth. Six is the number of man. So the number 10 represents what God wants to do through man in the earth. 10 is actually a number that represents God's order, but it also represents a testing. Will I be faithful? Will I allow the Lord to use me in the earth? You think about the 10 commandments. Will I, will I allow the Lord uh, uh, honor in my life? You think about the tithe, which means according to Leviticus 27, verse 32, it's the 10th. It's a test. Will I allow God the, the sovereignty over my resources? It, it's a picture of what God is doing through man in the earth. And God is saying right here, I'm about to do something when it comes to advance in my kingdom, I'm going to do something in the earth, but I'm going to do it through men and women of faith. I'm going to do it through you. He wants to use you and me to advance his kingdom. So he's given us these resources. He's given us talents. And what does he say? Do occupy this till I come. Use what I have given you to advance my kingdom until I return. Now, what I pray this message in this series does for all of us is that it challenges us to look at the seats of influence that we hold, the resources that he's given us mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, what he's equipped us with, and are we using our resources and our seats of influence, are we using it to advance his kingdom, or have we taken what he's given us for his kingdom and hid it in the earth? And lived a dualistic life. And that's what's wrong with the church today and has been for many decades is dualism. We put everything sacred over here. We wouldn't dare cuss in church, at least I hope you wouldn't, but cuss like a sailor outside the doors. If we, if, if, if we sung some of the stuff that's played in your automobiles in church, you'd leave this church and get on Facebook and say, you would not believe what they are singing at Word of God. But it's the same thing you play in your car. Or we would take our children to school and them learn one thing and be fine with it. But if we took them to church and they learned the same thing, we would leave that church forever. Why would you leave a church over what they taught your child and not leave a school system that would teach your child the same thing? In other words, we, we, we bought into this dualistic life where we live for God on certain times, but we don't live for him when we walk outside the church. And you can't live that way and advance the kingdom. Everything that God has given me, he's given me to advance his kingdom. Them. This whole stuff, well, I keep Jesus in my heart because I don't want to offend anybody. I'm glad my aunt didn't have that feeling. It was my aunt's faith and her salvation that, that allowed her to minister to me even when I rejected it. But it brought me and it led me to my salvation. I'm thankful she was not ashamed. She was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And church, we cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got to take this good news into a world that needs it. In other words, if God has given you a seed of influence, why do you think he gave it to you? He gave it to you to advance his kingdom. So he delivers these talents in verse 13. And he says, occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Read those words out loud. Occupy till I come. Now, the, 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 the seat that you're seated in this morning in this assembly, hopefully it was a seat that wasn't occupied when you took it. Because we don't want to be the church to walk up and say somebody, excuse me, that's my seat. Could you move? No, 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 no. We're glad somebody's in the seat. Right? But you can't sit in a seat that's been occupied. You can't take space that's being occupied. God has called us to occupy space for his kingdom. Glory to God. I am to occupy the space that he's given me. There's space that God has given me as a husband. I'm to occupy that till he comes. There is space that God has given me as a father. I'm to occupy that till he comes. There is space that God has given me as a minister of the gospel. I'm to occupy that till I come. I, I, I've got to recognize that in this life, I use what he's given me and I occupy this seat, this influence, these resources. I'm 
occupy. I'm, I'm holding this space. If you think about it, uh, one that occupies is really one that maintains space. I'm maintaining my space for the kingdom of God. I'm not going to let you pull Jesus out of my life just because I walk in that classroom. I'm not going to let you take the word of God out of my life just because I'm sitting in this seat that, that's been given to me by, 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 by whatever means. No, every place, every seat, every place of influence has been given me to occupy for the kingdom of God until he comes. Glory to God. That's my purpose in life. Now, does the world want us occupying seats and streets and everything else for the kingdom? No. That's what's going to lead Jesus to say what we're going to read next. I'm going to say this to you, church. <laughs> Ooh. God not only wants you to occupy what he gave you, he wants you to gain more territory with him. That's what we're about to see in this parable. He, he don't want you just taking, if God has given you a city block or a city street, he's saying, don't just let this thing in when you only took one street. Let, let it be said you took 10 streets. Amen. Amen. God doesn't want me just leading one life to Jesus. He wants me leading many lives to Jesus. I'm expanding the territory. I'm expanding the kingdom. But guess what? As I seek to expand the kingdom of God in other people's lives and in society, there's going to be opposition. Why? Because the little G God of this world does not want me advancing the kingdom of God. And we've got to begin to recognize that if there's a position that God has called you to, if there's a seat of influence that God has called us to take, the enemy doesn't want to concede that spirit space. Therefore, every position that God has called you to take will be met with opposition. And opposition is opposed position. And the enemy will always oppose a believer from taking positions of influence for the kingdom of God. But you and I have got to recognize it was for this purpose in which I was born. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And I will use what God has given me for the sake of advancing his kingdom. And guess what? The promise of God is so strong. The promise of God is so strong that Jesus said in Matthew 16, oh, by the way, as you go, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail. What is a fence used for? It's used to establish boundaries. What does the enemy do with his fences in this world? He's saying, you can't come here. You can't touch this. You can't influence this. Don't bring your Bible in here. Don't wear Jesus on your shirt. Don't come preaching that. The enemy's steady putting up fences, saying, we can't take our faith into society. Wants to claim a false narrative of separation of church and state. The enemy will do whatever he can to draw a line in the sand and tell us to keep Jesus on the other side. But I don't know about you, but I'm looking for born-again believers that are not ashamed of the Word of God, not ashamed of the love of God, not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus, that will take the word of God into places where the enemy has said, you can't come here. What do you think Jesus meant by the gates of hell shall not prevail? We got to storm the gates. So what, what, now let's look in verse 14 at what kind of setting we're in. See, in verse 13, he gave the 10 servants that he had called, he gave them 10 pounds. So if you look carefully in verse 13, you're going to see three action words, three, three things that happen here. They were called, they were equipped, and they were sent. We have those three words plastered over the main entrance here at Word of God. You see it every time you walk out. Called, equipped, and sent. Say it out loud. Called, equipped, and sent. Everybody's not called. You say, oh, I knew it. I'm a believer, but I'm not really called. No, no, I wasn't talking about you. If you're a believer, you're called. Every believer has been called to preach. You may not be called to pastor. You may not be called into full-time ministry. But every believer has been called to preach. Yes, amen. You talk about the weather, talk about Jesus. You talk about sports, talk about Jesus. You talk about politics, talk about Jesus. Amen. Yes, amen. Preach. Preach, preach, preach. Glory to God, preach. So he called them, then he equipped them with 10 pounds, which is a measurement of money in the parable, and then he said, occupy. That, that, that's being sent. That There's a position, there's a seat I'm holding, and I'm doing it for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. 
But watch the setting that we've been called to occupy. Verse 14. But his citizens hated him. Oh, look at there. But his citizens hated him. Hated who? Hated the nobleman. Hated the nobleman. Well, where is the nobleman? He went into a far country. He went into a far country. Well, who's in the, who's in the area he left? His occupants. The ones he's called to occupy. His called out ecclesia. Hallelujah. His representatives are still there. And what are they announcing? They're announcing that there's a king coming. The nobleman has gone to get his kingdom and he's coming back. But notice what the citizenship of that country said, verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, read the rest with me. We will not have this man to reign over us. Read that again. We will not have this man to reign over us. So the citizenship that the ten servants had been called to occupy were in an area or territory that was hostile to the soon coming king. To the point that they said, we want to send him a message. We will not have him rule over us. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like the world we're living in? Does it sound to you like the world we're living in where just about anything is accepted except the preaching of Jesus? Just about anything is accepted but the truth. You can go into the world and name about anything you want to name. But you name Jesus? Hey, one of my members told me that they were told by their employer, they said, listen, you wear Nike, Reebok, Under, uh, Under Armour, you wear all that, but don't wear Jesus in here. Something about that name. The enemy wants to silence the church, but I want to wake up the church. The enemy wants to tell you to leave your faith at home, but I'm telling you to take your faith to work. I'm telling you that you can't make an impact in this world if you leave truth at your house or if you leave it on the back dash of your car. We got to get truth off these pages. Get them in our heart. Get them on our mouth. Get them in our life. I have no respect for people that say, well, you know I don't use my position. You know, I don't let my faith affect my position. You don't let your faith affect your position? Then why did God give you your position? Would you say, I'm not going to let my faith dictate what kind of husband I am? Would you say, I'm not going to let my faith dictate what kind of, of a father I am? Would you say, I'm not going to let my faith dictate what kind of believer I am? Are you going to ignore the needs of your neighbor? Are you going to judge man by the color of his skin? Where, where are you leaving your faith? Are you leaving at church? Are you leaving at home? Is it still on the big white family Bible laid on your grandmother's coffee table? Are you going to live the word and do the word and be the word and advance the kingdom of God? I don't understand this where we, where, where we actually brag about not taking our faith forward. God's called us to use every seat of influence for his kingdom. And we want to go to church on Sunday for a photo op. But then sit in seats of influence and advance policies that are in direct contradiction of the word of God. I have no respect for your church Sunday going self if you don't live what you heard when you went to church on Sunday. I'm not trying to be a respect. I'm not trying to cast judgment or any of that. I'm just saying the church has got to be what God has called us to be. Otherwise, we're salt that's lost its savor and we're a light that's hid under a bushel. Jesus said, occupy, hold this down until I come. And oh, by the way, the citizenship of this world you live in, they hate me. Therefore, we will be hated. It ain't that we going out here trying to be hated. It's the condition of the world we live in. If you would, in your notes, next to verse 14, write Psalms 2. Psalms 2. Now, you stay right there in and, and, and Luke 19. You're welcome to come with me, but at least put a bookmark there. We're not done. We're almost done, but we're not done. And I want to read to you Psalms 2. Psalms 2 says this. Why do the heathen rage? The word heathen means unbeliever. Why do the unbelievers rage? What are folks so mad about? Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves. 
The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So God is saying there would be a time, and there has been throughout history, where those that sit in seats of authority, the kings and rulers of the earth, use their position against the Lord. They use their position against the Lord. Now, it might move us when we see that, but it never moves God. <laughs> Amen. Because the next verse says in, in verse 4, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. That's all you really think that's the way it's going to be. You really think you got the last word. God already knows what will be spoken at our funeral. You think he's worried about what we do in life? He says, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king, God says, upon my holy hill in Zion... I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And that's what we, that's what we see recorded in Revelation 5. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So since Jesus returns and he gains complete authority in the earth, the warning in verse 10 is this. Listen, it's so important. And I'm in Psalms 2, verse 10. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Which means here, I'm God, I'm Lord, it's all mine. If I have put you or allowed you in a seat of influence, use that influence by reverencing me. Amen. How would you like to have people that sit in seats of authority that fear God? Oh, hallelujah. The Bible says that when the righteous are in power, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Amen. Amen. So, so, so we're seeing here that if you sit in a civil seat of authority, you know, if you have any governing or power or influence, he's saying, be wise, be instructed, serve the Lord, do it with fear, recognize that this seat needs to be in subjection to the Lord. Then he says this in verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So his final warning in Psalms 2 is kiss the son. That's a covenant word. Embrace the son. Show affection toward the son. It'd be like a married couple at their wedding. You may kiss the bride. Enter into covenant with Jesus. Give affection and honor to Jesus. Kiss the son lest he be angry. He's saying use every seat of influence for the glory of the Son of God without shame or embarrassment. Amen. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to Luke 19 and we're going to pull it all together. Luke 19. Church, we got to get, we got to stop letting the enemy tell us where we can and where we can't take our faith. Uh uh. No, uh uh. No, that's the problem now. We done had too many raised up not knowing him. That's in power. We need people in power that know him, that seek him, that pray to him for the wisdom and the direction that is needed to guide a people to, to bring peace to any society. Amen. Hallelujah. So watch this here. We go back to Luke 19 where he's going to give out these talents, which is biblically a measurement of money, but it's referring to, hey, I'm giving you resources, mental, physical, spiritual, financial, and, and I'm giving you these resources to occupy. You're going to be doing it in a hostile territory where the citizenship of that territory actually hate me, but I'm still calling you to occupy, verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, because he's coming again, Having received the what? Kingdom. Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had what? Gained. 
What have you done with what I've given you? Do you realize everything God has given us, when we steward it right, should grow? Everything alive is growing. God wants me to grow in my influence. God wants you and I to grow in our territory. God is about growth. Yes, amen. So he said, okay, what have you done with what I've given you? What have you gained? Verse 16. Then came the first thing, Lord, thy pound, you only gave me a pound, but your pound that you gave me, I managed it in such a way that I now have 10 pounds, what you say, tenfold return. What did Jesus say about that? Verse 17. He said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little. Read the rest with me. Have thou authority over 10 cities? Wow. Why? Because he's returned with his kingdom. And so he's putting these men and women of faith that have been faithful in position of influence over cities, over territories, because that's the main point. The main point here is not how we manage money. The main point here is, is how are we gaining ground? How many souls are we winning? How many lives are being changed? How many marriages and families and lives are we touching through the kingdom of God? How many children would have grown up without God but are now growing up with a faith in him because of how we're managing resources? That is the point of the parable. He said, okay, you, you've been good with this. I'm going to give you 10 cities. Verse 18, and the second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. He said, likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. Another came saying, Lord, behold, here is your pound, which I laid up for you in a napkin. So he took what God gave him. He took what God gave him. Watch this. He took what God gave him, laid it in a napkin, and folded it up. And now you can't see what the Lord gave him, and he tucked it away. That's the individual that's not using your life to advance the kingdom of God, the word of God, the love of God, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have taken what the Lord has given you, and I've heard it said too many times, well, I may not live like I should, but God knows Jesus is in my heart. Well, bless you, Lord, Jesus, fill heart. that I can't see he's in there, I can't hear that he's in there, and I've not experienced him being in there. But I'm glad you just informed me he's all up in your heart. But what good is Jesus in your heart for society if you don't let Jesus out by the way you live, by the way you use your seats of influence? Jesus has called me to use my life for his glory and the advancement of his kingdom. So notice, the one that had the one said, hey, I got 10. He said, okay, I'll give you 10 cities. The one that had one said, I got five. He said, okay, I'll give you five cities. The one that had one said, okay, I hit it. I hit it. Nobody knew I had it because I didn't want to offend anybody. I didn't want anybody judging me. And then Jesus looked back at verse 23 and he said, whoa, whoa. wherefore then, why didn't you give my money to the bank? I mean, verse 23, that at my coming, I could at least gain a little interest. You didn't do nothing with it. Watch verse 24. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him the pound, the one pound, and give it to him that hath 10 pounds. Now, some might look at that and say, that's not fair. That's not fair. He already had 10 pounds. I only had one. You're going to take my one and give it to God that already had 10? Because the guy that had 10 proved he could manage it. God does not give us what we want. He gives us what we can manage. And because this guy proved he could take one and gain 10, God said, then give him another one. He'll have 20. It's all about how am I using what God has given me for the sake of his kingdom. Verse 25, and they said unto him, Lord, he has 10 pounds. Sounds like today's society. We should all have the exact same amount. But that's not the way God works. He gives you, gives you that based on how you manage it. Verse 26, for I say unto you that unto everyone which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. 
But those mine enemies, verse 27. But those mine enemies, that's the people back in verse number uh, 14 that hated him. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither, slay before me. That's the judgment of the last days we read in the end of the book of Revelation. The judgment that is to come. That is the world that we live in. We don't rejoice to see anyone judge. We want all to come to Christ. We want all to know the salvation of God. But you have to know there's coming a day when Jesus is returning and he will separate the wheat from the tare. He will separate the goat from the sheep. He will separate and, and, and only he has that right to do so. But we got to live in such a way that I might stand before him tonight. I might stand before him tomorrow and I'm going to have to give an answer for what he put in my life and how I used it for his glory. How I used it as a husband but how I used it as a father, how I used it as a teacher, how I used it as a mechanic, how I used it as a bricklayer, how I used it as an attorney, how I used it as a physician, how I used it as a coach, how I used it as a teacher, how I used it in whatever position you hold. How did you use what God gave you to advance his kingdom? And we've got to get out of this idea, and I'm going to close with this statement. We've got to get out of this idea that we take all things secular and put them over here, and then we take all things spiritual and put them over here and live this dualistic life. You'll never advance the kingdom living like that. And that's not the life that God has called us to live. Do you realize when Jesus called his church in Matthew 16, the Greek word is ecclesia. The word church in Greek is ecclesia. And it's the same word where we get the English word senate. What is a senate? Senators are representatives. We, each, we have two from every state. They're representatives. They come together and supposed to represent the territory that sent them. We are the Senate of Heaven. Come on. We are ambassadors for Christ. That means no matter where I go, whether I'm coaching a softball team, whether I'm coaching a soccer team, we're going to begin this practice with prayer, and we're going to end it with prayer. We're going to begin this game with prayer, and we're going to end it with prayer. And Saturday morning or whatever morning before we get together to practice, I'm going to give you a five-minute devotional that came from the Word of God. Parents say, oh, I don't like that. Then join another team. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to use every seed of influence to advance His kingdom. I'm not going to separate my faith from how I do business with people. I'm not going to separate my faith from how I treat strangers in the street. I'm not going to separate my faith on, on for how, I, how I, I vote or how I carry out civil office. No, I use every seat for his influence. I got invited to pray over a football game at Independence Stadium. And right before I, in the press box, right before I got to the mic, they said, no, 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 wait a minute. You know now this is a public game and you're not allowed to pray in the name of Jesus. You know that, right? And I'm like, I know you asked me to pray. You know what I did. I prayed in the name of Jesus. That mic was out. That mic was hot in the name of Jesus. Amen. They never invited me back to prayer. But I don't get seats that I'm not going to use for his kingdom. I'm not saying I'm perfect and have it together because I'm not. My point is, is that God don't even give us a seat except for the purpose of his kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. Church, that's the only thing that's going to change this world we're living in. It's time for the church to rise up. I say it's time for the church to rise up, amen, amen, and be influential. We know the truth. Speak it in love. You know the name. Use it. Hallelujah. Can we give the Lord a hand clap offering for his word this morning? Hallelujah. Let me pray for you and then pray with you and we'll close. Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray for all those that are assembled here. I pray for those watching this live stream right now, for those in their homes, kitchens, living rooms, those driving down interstates right now. Lord, we ask by your spirit that you would show us how to apply this word. How, Father, do we apply this word? with every head bowed, just for a moment. Because the Spirit of God is going to give us each a conviction. I know He will. How are you using the talents that God has given you? How are you occupying them? How are you using them for His kingdom? Church, we all miss it. I have missed it. 
We all miss it. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but that's not an excuse to keep on missing it. We can pray right now and say, Lord, forgive me. I've made it about me. I've made it about man. I've made it about other things. But I choose in this moment to make my life count for you. Church, the only thing, if we're saved, the only thing we carry into eternity is what we did for the kingdom. Let that sink in for a minute. The talent God has given you, it may seem small, but if you use it, if you'll occupy, he'll grow it. Can God expand? Can he grow the influence he's given you or is he having to pull back on it? You know what I love about Jesus and we read it in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 and in John 16 is that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And true peace only comes from him. And when you see individuals that don't have peace with each other, I can assure you it's because they don't have peace with God. The Bible says, the wicked flee when none pursue. Which means when I'm in the wrong, I'm always running, even if no one's chasing me. Do you have peace in your life? The Prince of Peace offers it. And his authority is one of peace. That's what Isaiah 9 7 said. He rules in peace. Peace is his promise. When we allow God to speak in our life and we allow him to use our life and we're in harmony with him, we have peace. At the end of every day, man will not always have peace with us. But at the end of every day, we can have peace with God. And maybe there's turmoil or anxiety. Our mind is not resting. And we're looking to other things, supplements, to take our mind off of its lack of peace. And that's how habits are formed and addictions get started. Looking for something we can drink, smoke, take, help my mind, settle our nerves. Church, there's no peace like the peace Jesus gives. And there's no life like the one surrendered to his will where you know you get up every day to do what God called you to do and to do it for his glory, to advance his kingdom. If you've never lived that kind of life, I want to tell you that he's ready for you to live that kind of life. And it doesn't matter what yesterday looked like. His mercies are brand new every morning. He conveyed, he conveyed his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died. He's not looking for the self-righteous goody two-shoe. He's looking for the person that's willing to be transparent and real and say, Lord, I know I've missed it. I know I have messed up. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to fill me with your spirit and to use my life from this moment forward for your glory if you'll make that decision today you'll find a peace you may have never known so I invite you to pray with me heavenly father I acknowledge that you give talents you equip lives for the sake of your kingdom. And I ask forgiveness for the things I've hidden in a napkin.
the influence you've given my life that I've not used for you. I ask forgiveness. I believe Jesus died for me, that I could live for him. And I know you are not ashamed of me. I don't want to live ashamed of you. So I ask by your spirit that you would give me the wisdom and the strength to occupy, to hold my space, the space you've given me, my territory, to hold it down for your kingdom, to use it for your glory. That you would use me, that others would know you. That you would use my life to advance the will of heaven in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.